Welcome to Actions and Limits. My name is Justin Atherton. I'm the Peak Performance Consultant for Confidence Unchained. With me as always is Paul Fortune. Paul is a mindset coach and the founder of A Call to Action. And together, we make Actions and Limits. Welcome to the show, the podcast where we talk about the actions we can take and the limits we create. Make sure to click that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. Uh, follow us on um, Instagram, Facebook uh, to stay updated on all the upcoming content and uh, whatever your podcast platform of choice is, make sure you hit that button so you're not missing an episode. Paul, I'm excited about our guest today. Manny Garcia is going to be on the show he was actually referred to us uh, by uh, another one of our guests, Adam Parr, from the podcast Parsitivity. So thank you, Adam, for referring the guest to us. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to have him on. I know you heard a little bit of his background story. Um, what's your take on, on Manny coming on the show today? Uh, my take on Manny coming on is reading his bio and not knowing you know too much about him, but I know that He's a guy that doesn't let excuses happen. Mm. You know, there's walls that are put up and he finds a way around them, over them, whatever he has to do to get past them. Um, his, his childhood is just horrible and he's going to get into it. And uh, I, I just want to hear his story. Okay. Well, well, let's go ahead and bring him out. I'm excited to, to hear what Manny has to share with us. So Manny Garcia was positioned for failure when his father kidnapped him as a small child at a time when the family suffered a tragic event with an older sister. While kidnapped, Manny dealt with a massive adverse, adversity due to his father's relentless verbal and physical abuse. The abuse continued for many years until his father's death in a fatal hit and run motorcycle accident. So Manny continues his journey by maximizing his life, the lives of others, through a simple notion of unslackable living, playing full out, helping others to play full out, and driving record-breaking results along the way in his legacy. He has accomplishments such as 20-plus years of leadership experience in sales and marketing with Fortune 200 companies. He's responsible for $1 billion in sales throughout the USA and Asia. He's a thought leader, a speaker, an educator through corporate workshops, conferences, and private events. He's an author and a podcast host of Unslackable. He's a peak performance strategist in sales, leadership, negotiations, and organizational turnaround. So everyone, welcome Manny Garcia to the show. Well, Manny, welcome to the show. We're really glad to have you here on the Actions and Limits podcast. Um, I know you, you were referred to us as a, being a great guest, so we're excited to pick your brain, Manny. Thank you for coming on the show, brother. My pleasure to be here with you guys, and I love what you're doing. Appreciate it, man. Well, I, I know you're involved in so many things, but I'm going to give Paul the floor because I know Paul is really excited about you know, <laughs> your, your backstory here. So I'm going to give it to him right off the bat to, to start asking some questions. Paul, go yeah. ahead. Well, I, well I, I just wanted to, you know, I know that you had a very traumatic childhood and I'd like to know that story because I know what you've done now and it's quite remarkable. And to know where you came from as a child to now is just Crazy. Awesome. So I'd love you to share a little bit of, of that childhood, if you would. Sure. No problem. Um, so let's start when I was uh, right at five years old. Um, there was a traumatic accident that my sister was involved in. She was 11 at the time. Uh, she had gotten out of school early that day and her and her buddy were walking down the sidewalk and um, they hear screeching and they look over and there's a car coming straight at them. Um, so the lady that was driving the car, she lost control of the car and car was going straight at her friend and instinct was for my sister to just basically push her friend out the way and in the process there was a big I don't know if you've seen those big steel utility boxes that sometimes are on the side of the road um, yep. so her arm got crushed against that and she lost her arm she was able to save the life of her friend um, and then during the hospitalization process and surgery for my sister's arm uh, my dad showed up which um, my mom had custody of myself and and my other two sisters at the time 
it was a really nasty divorce that took place. And my dad was kind of obsessed with, you know, him being with my mom again and all this other stuff. And there was a lot of trauma that, that was uh, being incurred by him into the family. And they forgot that my dad was a bit nuts. And um, he basically showed up and said, hey, listen, you know, since you're taking care of Mamie right now with the arm surgery and all that, let me go ahead and take Manny to breakfast, uh, you know, to McDonald's. I remember this vividly. And um, she said, okay, yeah, no problem. And that was the last time that they saw me. So my dad basically kidnapped me. And I didn't understand what that was, right? So, you know, my dad takes me to McDonald's, like he said he was going to when I was younger. Um, this took place in Puerto Rico, by the way, the accident. And when, we, when I was younger, around three, four years old, we were living in, in the United States in Orlando um, together as a family. And then the divorce took place and that's how the separation uh, happened. So, you know, I had remembered Disney and Mickey Mouse and all this stuff. So while we were at, at uh, McDonald's, my dad says, hey, um, you know, do you want to go see, you want to go see Mickey Mouse? And I'm like, yeah, I want to go see Mickey Mouse, you know? <laughs> and uh, so one thing led to the next. And from Puerto Rico, we went back to Orlando and he did, he took me to Disney. And, you know, one day after another, one week into another, you know, one month after another, you know, time just passed. And I would ask about my sisters and my mom and my dad would say, no, you know, boys with the boys, girl, girls with their girls. And there was some explicit stuff that he would say also regarding women and things of that nature, which I don't want to get into right now. But um, so, you know, I just basically became adapted to, to living with them. Right. And um, fast forward a few years later, uh, we jump around a little bit from Orlando to Miami for a couple of years. And then we end up in New York City. I'm going to a um, Catholic school there called St. Gabriel's Catholic School. And I'm about nine, nine and a half years old at that time. And, you know, we're having, we're having lunch. I mean, my buddy Patrick is sitting next to me and, you know, we're just chit-chatting. I can't remember what the conversation was about. And I remember I was looking at this little milk carton of a little girl that said missing on it, right? And he taps me on the shoulder. He's like, hey, look, there's this kid that looks just like you um, on my milk carton, right? So I look over and there I am, you know, four and a half, five years old picture of me. And it says missing Manuel Garcia Jr. And and I, I, I didn't understand it, right? Like, I was like, well, what, what the heck does this mean? Like, I didn't, I felt like I did something wrong. Like, I didn't understand how can I be missing, right? So we chuckled, whatever, finished finish lunch. And he threw his stuff in the trash. And I went in right after him. And I quickly picked up the carton of milk and I folded up, put it in my pocket. And um, later that evening, my dad was a cab driver in New York City at the time. And I said, hey, dad, you know, I said, I, I think I'm in trouble. And he looked at me like, you know, he used to give me some really good whoopings for many little different things. And I felt like he was going to give me another whooping and I showed him the milk carton and his eyes opened up this big and he's like, oh, okay. So he's like, you know what? He's like, you know, there's some people that are after us. They've been trying to take you away from me, blah, blah. He's like, you know, we're not going to pay attention to that. Everything's fine. No worries. And the very next day uh, we were on a car on our way back to Miami. All the furniture, everything is still back in the apartment in, in New York City. And then a couple of weeks later, then a truck shows up with all the furniture and everything like that. And then, that, you know, there's a, we, we find an apartment and, and that's basically how, how we live, right? So we're going back and forth. Now, growing up with my dad was not was not easy. Um, my dad is a very unique person in the sense that um, so he was he was from Spain and he was invited. He was a brilliant musician. Right. Um, and he played the his his, his his instrument was a trumpet. And um, he was invited by the Spanish government to represent Spain on a naval training ship, which still sails today is called Juan Sebastián del Cano, um, which is basically uh, the Navy you know, uh, ship for, for training up and coming sailors. And um, so he did that for quite some time and, and he traveled around to many different countries. And I guess when he landed the first time in New York City, he fell in love with the Big Apple. And, you know, back in those days, it was, you know, Glenn Miller and Liberace and all these huge musicians that were, you know, part of, uh, you know, the good old boys, right? And I think that he felt in his mind, if I can just come back here, being as talented as I am in music, um, I have a shot. I can be like Glenn Miller. I can be one of these huge musicians, right? And, and that's going to be my, my claim to fame. So the second time he landed in New York City, he never got back on the boat. So he actually, um, you know, defected from the Spanish uh, Navy and all this other stuff. And he was wanted for a couple of years until he became a citizen. And um, things didn't work out for him, right? So he became very bitter. And then he tried to live his dreams of music through us, through the kids. And that's the reason my mom and him got divorced is because he was very forceful with the girls and he was very abusive and he would you know, beat them up. And um, so my mom caught him beating the girls up one, one late night. She worked the grave, graveyard shift at a bakery back in those days. And she comes home and she hears, you know, screaming and yelling and all this other stuff. And then she realizes that he's, this has been going on for quite some time. So that's how the, that's how the divorce takes place. Right. So then all of that started happening with me. Once I got to about nine, nine and a half years old, um, he started, um, introducing the piano to me. And, and then that's when chaos started happening. Right. And, uh, 
um, I grew up feeling like I just wasn't enough, right? No, no, no matter how good I played, I made a, you know, I would make mistakes. He would get angry. He would beat me. I would get, make more mistakes so on and so forth. And it was never about love and connection. It was never about, you know, Hey, let's, you know, let's do this like this. Let's do this thing together. So it was a ton of pressure. And, um, I also grew up in an environment where everything was about the reward, right? So just, you know, let's win first place at this competition and I'll get you whatever you want. Right. Um, and then I had to grow up as, as an adult learning um, that the materialistic reward is not really what, what fulfills us as human beings, right? It's, it's mm-hmm. about the connection. It's about the interaction. It's about, you know, growing together. It's about all those soft emotional skills. And um, I became very suicidal around 10 years old. I tried taking my life three times. Mm-hmm. Um, luckily, I failed at that. So now imagine this, right? You're, you're, you're being told by your dad you're not good enough to play the piano. You're getting beat because you're not good enough. Um, when you do win, uh, you know, first place, whatever you, you get the materialistic things, you get the motorcycles, you get the four wheelers and you get the BB guns There's all the different trophies I wanted right growing up. Um, and then things are so dark and, and there's no love, there's no connection and all that. And then you, you try to take your life and it doesn't work. So now you feel like a bigger failure, right? Then you try to do it a second time and it doesn't work. Then you try to do it a third time. Now the third time around, it was such a painful experience that that's the day I decided, okay, hold on a second. This killing myself business is not, is not for me. That, that really, that really hurt. I'm not going to do that again. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you want me to kind of go into details of what those experiences were like, but it wasn't, it wasn't fun. And, um, you know, then right, a, right along that time when I was at my very worst mentally, that my dad was in a motorcycle accident and, and he ends up passing away. And then that's when I got, really, how old were you at that point? I was, I was 11. You were 11 when he, when you're, when you're, he passed, he passed, passed away. away. That's right. Wow. So I was 11 years old. Um, so from the time of nine to 11 years old, that period was just very, very, very dark. Um, so then, you know, him, him passing away and I hate saying this, but it's, it's a brutal truth, right? So his death was my salvation, right? So, um, I got reunited with my mom and that was a very unique experience because I had to go back to Puerto Rico, a lot of poverty. Uh, she was in toxic relationships where, you know, I got to see stuff that kids shouldn't see. Um, so I kind of went from like, you know, bad waters to, to really bad waters, right? Um, and then, you know, little by little having to kind of self parent and and try to go through the nuances of, of having to understand, you know, well, why me, Mm -hmm. you know, why does all of this have to happen to me? Right. Like, why did I get, you know, taken away from my family? Why did my sister, you know, have to lose her arm and I be had to become the victim of all this, you know, music stuff, you know, why was I not good enough to take my own life? Uh, you know, why, why do I have to go back into environment of poverty? Why do I have to go back into an environment where, um, you know, I'm seeing abusive, tendencies from my mother's relationships right um and then that kind of lasted for a few years and then finally just i couldn't live with my mom anymore because of the current situation i went moved in with my aunt and that was the first time that i kind of felt some normal stability my aunt was kind of like you know my saving grace uh she was uh, the, the mother figure for me and um you know just interacting with some very mature adults along the way um they, they were able to plant some seeds of, of hope, you know, within me and, and kind of, they were able to shed some light as to, you know, kind of like what I went through. They knew me actually, when the whole thing happened with my, with my sister and my kidnapping and, and all that other stuff. And, um, you know, those little seeds that they planted then later on built into a desire for me to just really help other people get to the next level, you know, cause I said, shit, if, <laughs> if I went through what I went through, um, you know, I can only imagine what other people must go through that are way, way worse. I remember my dad once, it was one night, I was like 10 years old. I, we were in Miami at the time. It was December, it was really cold out and I was trying to do my piano lessons and I had a uh, little Fruit of the Loom, you know, underwear and shirt on, no socks, no shoes, nothing like that. And he started hitting me, right? And I got, it was the first time I got angry at him. And I said, you know what? You got the devil in you. So he grabbed me, he threw me against the wall. I broke the wall with my drywall with my body, right? I was struggling to breathe and I looked at him and I said, you know, I don't understand why a man like you would do what you do to a son like me. I'm a good son. And he's like, I'm a good father. He's like, at least I don't make you bleed the way my dad used to make me bleed. Right. So in his mind, Mm. he justified his actions with the fact that he would beat the crap out of me. But, you know, because I wasn't bleeding, it was a better process. Right. It was a better experience than the one he had. And then he took me by the shirt and he said, I'll show you devil. And he he threw me outside and I'm getting, I'm 10 years old and it's around midnight. So I'm turns off all the lights. I'm knocking on the door, trying to get back into the, into, into the apartment. There's no response. So I said, okay, so I'm going to walk to my best friend's house, which is about a mile away in the dark, middle of the night, 
December, cold, freezing. So I get to my buddy's house, Brian Spittle house, and uh, I knock on the door. You know, parents are shocked to see me at that time of night. And I said, well, what's going on? I explained to them what's going on. They want to call the cops. I'm like, no, don't do that. Dad's crazy. He's got a gun. Like, I don't want to get you guys in any trouble. It's like, he'll be fine. Let me just spend the night here, go to school, and then tomorrow everything will be okay. And then the next day, you know, I borrow some clothes, go to school. I go to the landlord. Please let me into the apartment. I lost my keys. Let lets me in. I'm there. Dad shows up, you know, after work, like nothing, like nothing had ever happened. And I remember having that sense of hollow, you know, that hollow feeling of, man, the, the, like he didn't even care to ask. <laughs> was I okay? Like, where did I sleep? Was I hungry? Like none of those things. So then, you know, I remembered all of those things. And, I, and that's when I tell you that I, that I started to make a, a shift in my life and become a force for good for other people was because I said, man, if I went through what I went through and there's other people that are going through something similar or, or even worse, you know, who is their sounding board? Who is that person that is the light at the end of the tunnel for them that can kind of give them that, you know, that sense of hope, right? Uh, and that's what I did in my high school years. I just kind of became the, you know, the life of the party. I went from a place of being really, really dark to just going through this transition of wanting to, to help other people. And it took me a while, right? I didn't, I didn't like heal overnight. Like I'd, I was kind of faking it to, until I could make it type of, type of sense, right? And on an emotional standpoint, but I had major, major internal conflict. And then, you know, little by little, you know, just, um, you know, a lot of self-help books, a lot of videos, you know, a lot of Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, you know, Brian Tracy, you know, Les Brown, a lot of, a lot of that type of stuff, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, coaches. Um, How did you get motivated to read all those books and expose yourself to all that information? So, you know, the, the journey of growth is, is it could be short for some and it could be extremely long for others, right? So I was uh, 18 years old, graduated high school from Puerto Rico. Two days after that, I moved with my sister, Mimi, who had lost her arm. She was living in Orlando now at the time. Um, and, I, and I decided to, to move with her and she was gracious enough to open up her doors to, to have me. Um, and then soon after, I met um, somebody who would later become my wife. You know, we got pregnant when I was 19. I had my daughter when I was 20. Um, and I kind of grew up very quickly, right? Like at that point in time, I said, wait a second, you know, um, I know I'm a knucklehead. <laughs> I know I got some major issues. Um, and then I remembered that, that little voice in the back of my head from my dad saying, you know, hey, at least I'm a better dad than I was because I didn't make you bleed. And I said, there's no way in hell I'm going to put my kids through this, right? Like I need to figure me out quickly here because I, I, I need to grow up and I want my kids ever to go through anything like this. And then um, I remember one of the first major lessons in life was I wanted to be um, accessible, right? Like here I am, I have this beautiful little girl and I want people to be able to reach me. And this was right around the time when pagers were a big thing and cell, cell phones were just starting to be introduced. But I, you know, I was financially broke. My credit was horrible. Like I really, when I tell you I was a hot mess, I was a hot mess, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So at the time there was a big um, electronics store called Circuit City. I don't know if you guys remember that or not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm like, you know what? Uh, I know I can't afford a pager. Uh, I mean, a cell phone. Let me let me at least go get a, a, a pager. So I, I go to Circuit City that day. I'm all excited. I'm driving around a beat up Mazda RX-7, 1984. The muffler was broken. No AC. Um, you know, just just one of those. I'm one of those guys, right? <laughs> so so I show up. The walls are full of pagers. And I, I go with a humble pager that was like, you know, if you were credit worthy, uh, no money down, it was like six bucks a month, right? So I tell the lady, hey, I want this pager. She said, well, you got to fill out the application, fill out the application, whatever. There's a bunch of people there that, that morning. And she looks at me, she says, Mr. Garcia, I hate to inform you, but you don't qualify for the pager. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? Hold on a second. Like, who doesn't qualify for six bucks a month? Like, is this the real thing right now? Right. <laughs> and, and, and I look around and I'm sure people weren't looking at me like this, but I swear everybody had like this loser face on, like looking at me like I was the scum of the earth. And uh, I didn't have, the, she said, the only way we can walk up with the pagers, we're going to, you have to pay for the pagers like 300, 350 bucks. And then you have to, you have to prepay for the lease for six months at a time. And I just didn't have the money. So I walk away with no pager and I start bawling, man. I start bawling. I, I'm like, man, what a mess. Like what the hell's wrong with me? Right. And then it gets worse. Cause then I remembered, wait, I got to get into that crappy car now. Right. So here I am crying, <laughs> getting into a car in, in Orlando, Florida, in the middle of the summer with no AC. I used to drive around with the three ring binder out my window to force air into the cabin. I kid you not, man. It was, it was one of those type of things. Right. <laughs> and uh, I remember driving this car and going down the highway and thinking to myself, this is ridiculous. Like, I just need to like this, this is too painful. Like I can't handle this anymore for a fraction of a second. 
I'm like, you know what? The next concrete barrier that I see, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna drive right into this thing. Like, screw it. Like, I really had that thought in my head, and it was for like a fraction of a second. Then I shook my head and said, Wait a second, what the hell am I thinking? I got this. I got my baby daughter. Like, I gotta be, I, I gotta be that guy that I said I was gonna be that force for good, right? That force for positive change. Anyway, make a long story short, I get there and I have to, you know, basically tell my wife at the time, all right, I didn't qualify for six bucks a month. You know, I'm a loser. You know, thank you for joining my club, you know, <laughs> you know, and then having to look at my baby girl in the crib and kind of like letting her know without her understanding what I was saying that, you know, hey, daddy, you know, is trying to do the right thing here, but daddy's a loser. So, you know, that type of thing. And that was the rock bottom moment that really got me to say, I need to do something about my life. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a circle of influence. I didn't have people around me that were successful. I didn't have somebody that I could go to that had the answers for finance or for, you know, mental well-being or any of those type of things. And, you know, the internet at that time was, wasn't really a, a huge thing yet, right? It was kind of like dial-up, AOL type of thing. I didn't have money for that either. So library was a thing, right? So mm. I said, you know, let me go to the library. And, and I started going to the library and I started pulling up different audio programs and um, I bought myself a used Walkman at the a little Sony Walkman, and I would listen to this stuff all the time. And then I, uh, you know, once I made a little bit more money, saved a little bit more money, you know, bought a course. And then I just basically became a student of, you know, some of the stuff that was being taught. And, you know, that that preparation and 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 what that, kind of work were you doing to pay the bills? So at the time when we got pregnant, I was a guy working at a supermarket, a big Spanish supermarket, which is no longer a business called Extra Supermarket. And I used to be a deli clerk, man. I used to be that guy shaving ham and cheese, you know, and all the, you know, older folks would come in, hey, please put the little wax paper in between each thing. Like I was one of those, guys. I took pride in what I did though, but I was a hell of a ham shaver, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but at that time, man, I'm making whatever it was back in those days, you know, $6.25 an hour or something like that, you know? So I was just barely making enough money to put gas in my car and, and you know, paycheck to paycheck. And my wife was at the time a hairdresser. So she was making a little bit of money, you know, and so, you know, I made a shift. I transitioned from that, you know, once I started kind of going through some of the self-help courses and things of that nature, my, my uh, sister said, you know, man, you got a good personality. You know, you got the gift of gab. Once you become a server, at least you could be a little bit more in control of your income. You can make some tips. There'll be definitely a lot more money than what you're making right now. So I became a server and, you know, as I would make tip money, I would kind of take that money and I would buy courses and I would, you know, become a student of some of the things that were being taught out there. And, and then that led on for about eight years. And then, um, you know, I just started preparing. Right. And I got to a point where then I became a corporate trainer for Planet Hollywood. Okay. Um, and I was traveling around and opening up there, you know, starting to grow. Right. There's four or five years of personal development and stuff like that. That stuff starts to help. Then you start thinking about leadership. Then you start getting to training positions. You start traveling with, in this case, Planet Hollywood and you know, I was doing really well. I was positioned to become the next manager for, for the Orlando location, which was the largest at the time in, in the country, actually in the world. It was the largest, it was the largest restaurant for Planet High at the world. And, you know, that would have been 75,000 plus, you know, your job. Um, but I just, I felt like, man, there's something else that I, I need to be doing here. And then that's when I got into sales, you know, um, and then life changed, you know, get into sales and now you're really in control of your own destiny and you can make, you know. What were you selling? So I got involved in vacation ownership um, with a smaller mom and pop organization here in Orlando, Florida. And, you know, they had a great training program and I was blessed to have some really good people in the business that just took a liking to me. Right. Um, and they kind of, you know, showed me some of the sales hacks and things of that nature. So I kind of went through the learning curve very, very quickly. I broke like, is that like timeshares? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I did it. I started off with a mom and pop type organization. Um, and then after about two years, so rewind, I broke a bunch of records. I became one of the fastest uh, promoted people in that, in the, in that uh, company at the time. I became a manager, made all kinds of crazy money. It was, it was amazing. Um, but then when I got into leadership, I realized they didn't quite have the brand that I really wanted to be an ambassador of, you know, in terms of um, customer service and value proposition and all that other stuff. Sure. And then that's when I started looking to other big companies like Marriott and things of that nature. And then I joined Starwood at the time. Um, which was uh, the parent company for the Sheratons and the West and St. Regis, all that. Yeah, and then, many, I have a quick question for you. Uh, you know, coming from poverty, not making very much money, you said making $6.25 an hour, and then going into, in sales, making huge amounts of money. Did that affect you? Because there's a lot of people that I know that made a lot of money in sales, 
and spent it like, you know, like they were paycheck to paycheck making, you know, 30, 40,000 a month and they're living paycheck to paycheck. And then all of a sudden the, the economy changes and they didn't have any money, which they were making 300, you know, a K a year and not having any money to their name. Did you have experienced the same type of thing or, or were you pretty good with your money? So I was pretty good with my money. Um, and the reason for that, again, you know, when I realized that I wasn't good enough for the six bucks a month, which was the least for that pager, I realized that I needed to preposition myself for success financially. Right. And everybody else was around me was, you know, driving around the Beamers and, and the Mercedes and the Corvettes and all that other stuff. Right. Um, I didn't do that. I took a different approach. Um, I did. I did sell my 1984 Mazda RX-7. <laughs> <laughs> and my next, my next car. Here I am at this point in time. I went from making, you know, as a server trainer, I was making about forty five thousand. Um, and then my first, in my first nine and a half months in vacation ownership, I broke uh, a little bit over one hundred seventy thousand. Right. So I was able to pay off all my credit card debt, everything like that. But my first car after that car was a Pontiac, a used Pontiac Sunfire. Um, you know, and, and that was basically a twofold. Number one is I could have afforded to pay cash for something better. Um, but I didn't want to put all my money into a car that I knew was the depreciating asset. So although my interest rate that first time around on that car, I think was something like 14 or 15%, it was 14 to 15% on like, you know, $15,000. Right. So I, I, I realized, you know what, it's okay. I don't mind paying interest on this plus I needed to fix my credit and all that. Um, but no, from the very beginning, I, I, I was, I've always lived way below my means. Um, which is a blessing because I've never really had the stress of any of the ups and downs that we've been through. You know what I mean? In terms of economic decline or the real estate market collapse in 2008, anything like that. So I was, I was pretty blessed. I did see what you're talking about though. I saw many people making, you know, quarter million dollars, 300,000 living paycheck to paycheck, you know, living in the million dollars, you know, just baking it. Right. And I was just like, man, you know what? I, I will eventually own one of these, but I have to have enough money <laughs> put aside and invested that I know that I won't be able I won't, I won't have to blink to in order to make my, you know, sure. my bills, pay, pay my bills or whatever, you know, plus my main priority was to really set my kids up for success, you know? So instead of buying all the expensive stuff, I, I prepaid for my kids. I have three kids now. So, you know, prepaid for their college education, you know, made real estate investments. I do real estate flipping today. You know, I invest in stocks, you know, I, I play around a little bit with cryptocurrency you know so i have you know man, i gotta give you credit paper. man like it, it seemed like you had a lot of like great insight like starting out like just from all the information you exposed yourself to what would you say was the most influential like information that you came across because you, be, you being able to come out of that and being and and having a financial mindset and having the sales mindset beforehand i, I know you're doing amazing things now but early on it seemed like you had your shit together so what, what was the most influential stuff that you were exposed to early on? So good question, right? Um, so I, I didn't have my shit together <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for, a, for a really long time, right? So my daughter, my daughter was born when I was 20. Um, so financially, things started turning around for me when I was like 28, 29 years old, all right? Um, just to put things in perspective to you. So from the time I was denied the pager, to the time I actually started making enough money to, to, to you know, to, to do whatever I wanted to do, mm -hmm. right, was eight, nine years. So for eight or nine years, it was all preparation, right? And yeah. it was all listening to people that had gone through similar situations that I went through. You know, again, we're talking about like Tony Robbins, right, the Dean Graziosi's, you know, the Les Browns, the Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, all these other people, right, talking about what you just said. You know, hey, listen, you know, you got to find opportunities where you can really be in control of your own um future right and sales was one of the that's one thing that a lot of these people talked about right sales is kind of you're you're kind of like an entrepreneur when you go into sales because your your income is in direct proportion with your ability to be able to influence with your ability to close with your ability to be able to you know handle objections and all those type of things right so that's why i i i decided not to take the job as a manager at planet hollywood at that time and get into sales which was risky right which was a big deal for me because i'm like okay cool if i become a manager I'm making 75, that gives my family some stability. I can pay my bills. I got a little bit of money left over to, you know, support my family. And then going into an environment where it was strictly 100%, com, you know, commission. I would have never been able to muster up the guts to, to jump into sales where you're going from an environment, again, where you, you have a, a safety net where now it's 100% on you, right? Had it not been for all those years of preparation. So to answer your question in terms of, you know, the most influential thing that I think I was exposed to was just basically... Um, believing 
believing in everything that I was immersing myself into, right? Like these are people, here are people that are super successful that, that went through it, that went through mm -hmm. similar. If you look at Tony Robbins childhood experience, for example, right? He went through major poverty and multiple fathers and he went through his own trials and tribulations, right? And it wasn't until he decided to become an entrepreneur and do his thing that and he had all these celebrities at the time. I remember personal power too is one of the first courses that I purchased, which was like three, 400 bucks. And for me at that time, that was a huge amount of money, right? Today is nothing. But back in those days, you know, 400 bucks, I'm like, what? But, you know, you had all these celebrities talking about this. And so I started believing really in, in these role models, right? Because I, I know I didn't have the circle of influence of people that I can tap into. So I said, well, the next best thing that I have is these people, right? These coaches that, you know, claim to be successful or whatever. So, um, you had and that then buy in into all of that that you were exposing I had to believe, yourself I had to. to buy, yeah, I had to buy into it. I had to believe in it, right? Like 100% passion and conviction. I had to believe if I spent the money and I've invested, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use it. So when I tell you I became a student of the material, I mean, I was, I was listening and, and re-listening to the same, I would praise it. Sometimes I listened to the same episode five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 times before moving on to the next, because, you know, there was, every time I listened to it, I found that I was picking up new pieces of information sure. that, that made sense to me in my life. Right. And then the other thing too, was that, you know, when, when my father passed away and I went back to live with my mom, I mean, that was extreme poverty, right? Like there was one year, the first year, which was Christmas. Right. I remember she was around the corner and she was talking, I get emotional just thinking about this. Um, and she was talking to my aunt and she was crying because she had asked me, Hey Manny, you know, what do you want for Christmas? And all I wanted was like a little back in those days, very much Voltron. I don't know if you remember Voltron, yeah. but Voltron yeah. was a big thing. I just wanted a little Voltron doll, right? Which was, I don't know how much it was, maybe 20 bucks, 25 bucks, 30 bucks, something like that at that time in Puerto Rico. And my mom is sobbing. She is sobbing because she doesn't have the 25 or 30 bucks to get me a gift. Her first Christmas with me, right? She doesn't have the money to get me that doll, right? And I remember thinking to myself, I don't want to put that type of pressure on my mom. And I don't want to put that, that type of pressure ever on myself or my children. So, you know, living in an environment of, you know, poverty like that, I mean, it's rough, right? I mean, you got, you're living on food, families on food stamps, right? So the first week or two of the month, things are good, man. We're eating pork chops, you know, we got little, little, you know, you know, uh, what do you call that flank steak? We got some chicken, we got all the, and then towards the end of the month, you know, we're eating rice and beans and potatoes and, you know, like in Puerto Rico, we have all these different meals that we make with roots, basically, you know, yaltia, malanga, yuca, whatever. And you're eating that type of stuff with onions and maybe a little bit of um, codfish on top, you know, so that everybody can get a little, you know what I mean? Like, so you grow up in an environment like that and like, I can't, I can't, I can't repeat this. You know, I can't repeat this. And it's tempting. And, it, and it, there was many times, don't get me wrong, where I mismanaged money and, you know, bought stuff that I didn't need to buy. And, you know, you get excited, sure. you go buy a Rolex and, you know, you, little things like that along the way, right? But it wasn't like, to the extreme, right? I wasn't spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on nonsense, you know? Um, and I mean, today, you know, I wear an Apple watch, you know, 300 bucks, you know, watch that gives me all the things that I need. And I'm com <laughs> completely comfortable with that, right? I live in a home that I can pay with my eyes closed, no matter what happens to the economy. You know, I drive around a car that's very gas efficient and, and whatever, you know, can I drive around the, the Lamborghinis? Oh, absolutely. You know, can I, can I go buy one today cash? Absolutely. But I choose not to, you know, I have a bigger vision. I want to build something. I want to help other people in the process and, and all that type of good stuff. But Thank you for the question. Like that, between between 20 and 29, did you visualize your life today the way it is today? You know what? No, life has gotten way better than I ever really thought it was going to be, right? Like I didn't ever think I was going to have the amount of growth that, that I had. Now I had a vision, right? Like I, I knew what I wanted. I wanted to be financially independent, whatever that means, right? Like to me, it wasn't like, okay, I need to have the mansions and all that other stuff. It's like, I need to be able to have enough bank in the money, uh, enough money in the bank that I can sustain myself for a few years if something were to really happen. I want to make sure my kids' colleges are taken care of. You know, I want to be in a, in a loving, fruitful relationship with my spouse and all this other stuff, right? I want to make sure that that my health, I'm 40, I just turned, yeah, I just turned 47 years old. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was able to enjoy my kids, that, that I'm taking care of my health and all that other stuff. So, but, you know, it's, it's way, it's way better than what it was, right? Like, um, I'm blessed, man. I, I work with amazing companies. I work with incredible people. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, touching thousands of people on social media. Like, it's a beautiful thing, man. So from the point of you doing the timeshare thing, uh, take us after that point. It sounds like you probably exploded. Yeah. So what happened is after I made the decision to leave kind of that mom and pop organization, um, I was blessed with getting started with Starwood and there was an explosive growth. I mean, it was just crazy, right? It's like all those eight, nine years worth of preparation just paid off in every, I, I actually stepped down from a leadership role that I had uh, at the mom and pop organization to just a sales rep over uh, on, with Starwood. 
And then from that point for every single year for eight years, I was getting promoted, right? So I went from a rep to uh, assistant manager, manager, senior manager, assistant director, director. And then I ended up running the entire operation as a project director of sales. Um, and, you know, every year more money, every year more recognition, every year, you know, just explosive growth, not just from myself, but from my teams. My teams always have outpaced uh, most of the other divisions within the organizations. Um, today, my team uh, that, that I'm running over at one of the uh, Marriott properties, um, their efficiencies are some of the best in class for the whole organization. Hmm. Um, but, but I've taken an entrepreneurial mindset, right? So um, I, I call myself, at, so the two things, right? I, I do my stuff on the side. I do real estate investing, coaching for organizations and individuals. Um, but then I'm also an employeepreneur still today, right? And the reason for that is number one, I enjoy what I do. I, I believe in the brands. Um, I make a ton of money. Um, and I'm able to make a positive impact, right? And I, and I continue to use that platform of working with these big organizations as a platform to continue to grow and develop myself, right? Um, case in point, right now going through COVID, I mean, this is unprecedented times for many people. And right now we are in the process of reinventing, right? Our sales processes, our operational processes, you know, who we're gonna keep, who we're not gonna keep, you know, that whole thing of, you know, who is, um, uh, the, the person that we have on the sidelines that we're that we're going to bring back, you know, the type of type of experience that that we create now for these customers that are buying these high end ticket items, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just explosive growth, right? But the explosive growth came from all those years of preparation, and then any conversation I would have with any of the top leaders in the organization, they automatically peg you as, oh, what? Well, hold on a second, this 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 guy's got talent, right? This this kid's sharp. This this is somebody we got to keep an eye on, right? So it's it's all about bringing value, right? And that's one of the biggest takeaways that I that I learned was, no matter what you do, and I, I made my dad sound kind of like a like an ogre, right? Um, poor guy, you know, he was dealing with his own um, life challenges that he was never over you know he was never able to overcome right but there's one thing that he always did teach me and that was no matter what you do in life whether you're a garbage man or you're a taxi driver whatever if you made the decision to take on that role then you have to play full out right just like i expect you to play full out on the piano you have to play full, you have to be your very best mm -hmm. so then just taking that attitude into whatever organization or job or whatever you take, if you just take that attitude that you are an employeepreneur, this is your home, you know, this is your shop, you know, this is, you made that decision and you pour yourself into that, that's contagious. And yeah. everybody else around you that are the decision makers or the owners or whatever, they will see that, you know, and then then, oh, then more opportunities start to show up. I mean, there's been so many, oper I'm, in a, I'm in a position right now, which is a beautiful thing, right? Like I could go work um, for the competition, I, I, in bigger and bigger titled roles, making 150 to 175 thousand dollars more a year, like like that right now, and I choose not to, because you know I enjoy what I'm doing with who I'm doing it with right now. I believe in the core values of the organization. I believe in the product. That the the clients are happy. You know the teams are are kicking butt, and I got some, and it gives me the flexibility and the freedom to do other things on the side that bring me fulfillment and joy, and 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 fulfill my my purpose for for a living. You know. So my biggest message to anybody that listens to this is, you know, and right now there's a lot of people that are lost in the sense that they may have gotten furloughed or maybe even laid off. But then here's the catch to that. So if you're lost right now because you're you were one of those people that were impacted, first question I want you to ask yourself is, did you truly enjoy what you were doing before you got furloughed or before you got laid off? Because <laughs> You know, it's the first, because here's what it is. A lot of the times, you know, we, how many people do we know they're in a bad relationship, right? And complain about being in a bad relationship. Then all of a sudden they break up and then they're like, oh, crying about the relationship. What are you doing? <laughs> it's like, you hated being in the relationship. Like, come on, man, like wake up, right? Like this is your opportunity to go and to fly and to go make amazing things happen, right? So the same thing with, and people that are employees or people that own a business sometimes we become slaves to a business right and and here we go business is now under we're we're, cr we're we're crying over spilled milk we're crying over the fact that we lost something that we hated in the first place this is a great reset opportunity for you this is the time for us to wake up to take and evaluate you know our experience in the past and say wait a second how do i reinvent myself you know or how do i become essential Right. So like right now, my message to everybody that I talk to within organizations, because we don't know how long, how much longer COVID is going to be around. Right. Sure. So, 
you know, how do we how do we ensure that if there's a second round or a third round of layoffs or furloughs, how do we ensure that you become essential? It's very simple. Provide more value than what you're getting paid for. Then you become essential. It's that simple, right? And that's my philosophy for living. That's my philosophy in relationships. That's my philosophy in business. That's my philosophy in, in any type of uh, situation that I'm in is I try to show up and bring as much value as I can to become quote unquote essential. I never used the term essential until now. Because, you know, now with this whole COVID thing, everybody uses a whole, you know, sure. essential, essential work. Everybody else is furloughed, everybody else is laid off, right? Yeah. But it's just, it's brilliant. It's just a great opportunity for us as human beings to reset. And if that means, listen, downsizing, that's okay. You know, if you got yourself into position to your point, Paul, where, you know, people were over leveraged, you know, because had the big house and the expense, it's okay, give that shit up. You know, let's, let's take a step to take a step back to reset, to regroup, man, and live the life that we are designed to live without all the bullshit pressure of the chaos that we create for ourselves. Um, so now's a beautiful time to do that. hundred sure. percent. Man, the, the thing that comes to mind for me is I, I think you are the epitome of the statement. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity because I, I, I I'm sure there's people out there going, man, Oh man, he's such a lucky guy. He, man, he's got it good. He's so lucky. No, it was the preparation that you put in over those eight years and then the opportunities, when they became available, you seized them, took a hold of them and said, this is mine. I'm going to make it mine and do the best that I can do with that. So the whole time you're talking, I'm like, man, that, that statement just kept rolling around in my head, man. That quote. I got goosebumps, Justin. I got goosebumps. You know, it's funny. I have it right here behind me. I have, you know, back in the day, right? Uh, it's all, it was all CDs, right? Everything's digital nowadays. But I have probably about $20,000 worth of CDs that I bought over the course of the last 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And I've spent probably another 50 or 60,000. My here's, here's, I'm a junkie at personal growth, right? Like I've flown to Fiji with Tony Robbins and I've done one of his mastery courses there. I mean, I fly all over the place looking for answers, you know? So I've spent, I've, I've created an education, right? Through the university of hard knocks for myself mm -hmm. and I paid for it, right? And, and it's a beautiful thing because here's a problem that we, and I, and I'm guilty of this, you know, we think that sometimes we go and we read a book and then that's enough for us to change our life around. That's not the case. You know, yeah. you got to read the book. You got to study the book. You got to read other books. You got to surround yourself around the other people. You got to practice what you preach. You got to implementation. Be you got to implement, you got to execute, you got to measure, right? You got to do all these things, right? Um, so you're right. And, and it took, like I said, it took me eight, nine years before my life really started changing around on all aspects, my health, my mindset, um, you know, my finances, my communication skills. Uh, it's funny because when I first came back from Puerto Rico, you know, moving back and forth from the U.S. to Puerto Rico, I had this heavy, like Tony Montana, Scarface accent, right? Like I used to talk like this when I first got into sales, you know what I mean? So it was, you know, you can imagine, right? Anybody that was of Hispanic descent that that would get that was given as an opportunity to present to i would sell them he gave me you know somebody who was white or somebody who was british for god's sake they'll be like what the? <laughs> so i actually i actually had to take courses to try to correct my my accent you know, i mm -hmm. took i took a vocal lessons to try to get rid of some of that stuff because i knew that was a handicap i didn't want to be put into a little box that says you know this guy is thug like right because unfortunately i spoke like one you know and i looked like one at, at, a, at a certain point in time you know i was funny i had a great personality but that thing was still there and somebody who's going to spend you know at that time 15 20 000 to buy a timeshare you know they're going to buy from some young punk kid who barely can speak english like what what, what kind of value can i bring right sure um, but again i wouldn't have had I wouldn't have had the notion of doing that, of going through vocal, you know, lessons had I not listened to well-educated, well-spoken people that that were just juicing me. You know, it's just like listening yeah. to these people. Man, I want to, I want to talk like this person. I want to be able to think like this person. I want to be able to. So it's so important that that you prepare and yet you're patient at the same time. I like that. Man. What's the future for Manny? So right now, I'll tell you, you know, I've, I've gotten to a point in my life where, um, and let me let me say this too, right? As we go through our journey in life, I don't know if you all know about like the six human needs, right? But there's like significance, there's love and connection, growth, contribution, variety, you know, all that stuff. Um, we we those those change for us, right? And there was a there was a specific period of time where I was just all about significance, right? Me me me, I want to make a lot of money, you know, my family, you know, da, 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 all this other stuff, and. And then as you kind of grow up and you mature and then you start to, to touch people's lives along the way, um, then you start to realize, man, we're a lot more powerful than, than we think that we are. 
I don't want to be long winded, but I want to answer your question, Paul, with the following. I didn't really understand what my purpose was in life until one day um, I decided to, to do this, this incredible, like emotional morning huddle right in front of 80 plus sales reps. Right. And I'm just, you know, I'm just going to pour right into this thing. And we were going through a time where there was a lot of challenges because that's when September 11th had happened. Remember with the Twin Towers and all that? Yeah. There was a lot of fear out there and everything like that. And I decided to share my story about one of the times that I tried taking my own life, right? And um, how I just felt like my life was so dark and it was so bad and that there was no way of getting out of the hole that, that I was in that I actually started to value death more than, than being alive, right? So anyway, I do this big emotional morning huddle with a, with an incredible ending in the sense that guys, you know, we're all experiencing these painful experiences right now. There's people that have died in the process, right? Thousands of people in New York City, um, but we will get through this, you know, and the way that we get through this is, is through community. It's through togetherness. It's through common goals and visions by lifting each other up. And that was the whole kind of underlying message, right? <clears throat> So um, anyway, I'm done with, with my morning meeting, standing ovation. It's awesome. I'm like, damn, that was good, right? Like I walk away feeling, ah, Manny, Manny showed off today, right? <laughs> so then I go, I go into my office and um, there's a young lady that walks in and she's just bawling. She's just, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. She's bawling, right? Like crying, like, like a little girl that somebody just, you know, stole the, the, the old ice cream from. And I'm like, hey, what's going on? What's the matter? She's like, I just want to let you know that I woke up this morning thinking about taking my life hmm. and, and God placed you right here, right now with that message. And I honestly was going to take my life. I had the jar. I had the jar full of pills in my purse right now that I was going to swallow at the, at, right after work today. Cause going home to me is so painful. I said, well, let's talk about that. Right. And anyway, make a long story short, you know, I don't actually, I don't want to, I don't want to give any of the details because then somebody that knows this story might know who she is. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to compromise her. Right. But anyway, that was, that was the moment when we we're done and everything like that. And, and, you know, everything was good. And she ended up becoming one of my top reds for a really long time after that. Right. Cause she, she, we, we went to some sessions and things like that. Um, that's the day that I, that I said, man, we never know how much pain people are in. You, you never would have known it. Like this girl, you show up to work, do her thing and go home. And you would never, you would have never known that she was where I was once in my life. Right. And it took that one message. It took that, that emotional connection. It took that sense of community, right. For her to feel like, wait a second, there is people here that care. You know, there is people like me out there. Right. And that was kind of the turning point. So to answer your, your question, Paul, for me, um, I decided to come up with this concept called unslackable. Um, it's, I'm just starting it. It's in the very, you know, uh, early phases. Um, but for me, the content of unslackable is how do we live a unslackable life? And there's different buckets, right? You got your finances, you got your career, you have your health, you got your family, you got this, that, the other, right? Relationships. Um, and, and it's through the concept of basically community, right? Masterminding, right? Is going and finding some of the best people in the world that have those answers that I was looking for when I was young, right? When I was 20 years old, no money, trying to get a pager for six bucks a month, and I was denied. And I had nobody to go to, right? And nowadays it's easier because there's internet and you could Google and you can probably find a million answers, right? But, you know, basically creating an environment where people can find answers to what's troubling them the most. And, and that to me, that's going to be you know, my, my, my footprint on this planet, um, you know, right now it's a passion project. I'm not doing any of this with hopes to make a bunch of money. You know, I'm of the belief that if you do what's right and you just create tons of value, then opportunities will show up. So, you know, that's kind of like where we are. That's amazing. Unslackable, baby. Unslackable. <laughs> that's awesome, Mandy. How, so how can our viewers and our listeners get a hold of you if they want to reach out to you, if they want to check out your content or what you're doing, or, or even check out this unslackable once it's rolled out how can they reach out to you manny yeah so they can they can find me on the website unslackable.com if they google unslackable you'll be able to find my linkedin platforms and all that other good stuff there too and then um i just got invited to participate in clubhouse are you guys on clubhouse at all yet yes i i i was gonna ask you i swear i heard your voice over the last couple days manny it's a, uh, it's a powerful thing. Have you been talking on there the past few days, man? So I, I, I tested out one of the, one of the rooms a couple of days ago. This was uh breakfast with champions. That's um, the exact room I was in, Manny. But um, I'm going to start a different, I'm going to start a different room. And um, you know, I'm excited to, to give that a shot because that kind of um, platform really bridges 
what I'm talking about, right? You got heavy hitters sharing their best practices. Anybody can just jump right into a room and, and listen in. So, you know, I plan on doing something like that there too. And, and I'll provide some of that information on the website. So that's amazing. And, and definitely reach out to me on there too, man. I'd love to hear, hear you sure, again, man. you know, sharing some, some amazing insight, man. So do, we'll do. a lot of great stuff. Paul, you got yes. something else to wrap it up? Yeah, with? I got one last question for you. What does that Rocky quote say? The Rocky quote, let's see, this one says, nothing is real if you don't believe in who you are. Hmm. Paul's like a big that. Rocky fan. I actually had that made out when I was living in Thailand for a few years. Um, I saw there's this local artist. He's a, he's a Thai artist and he comes up with all these pictures and then he puts some of their quotes on there. I love the one in the middle, which is Dolly. It says, intelligence without ambition is a bird without wings, hmm. which, is, uh, which is pretty awesome. Amazing stuff. <laughs> good Amazing eye, good stuff. eye, Paul. <laughs> he, he's a he's a he's a big Rocky fan. Plus, he got to run up the steps out there in Philly. So you know, he reenacted oh, that. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I got to meet uh, I got to meet Rocky or Sylvester Stallone a few times when we were doing the Planet at Hollywood thing because we would do all the grand openings with Is all the he part guys. owner or was he, he part? He, he was. Yeah, him, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Bruce Willis, Demi Moore, uh, Willoughby Goldberg. Yeah, there was a handful of them that. Uh, that kind of own that deal. They don't own it anymore. I don't think, but yeah. Hmm. That's awesome. Well, Manny, we like to wrap up the show with the title of our podcast and mine actions and limits and ask these questions. What would you say out of all the experience, all the preparation you've done, what is the number one action that people could implement right now to make a huge difference in their lives? Oh, good question. Number one action that they can implement. So is taking action, right? So I think that I think that um, there's a lot of people that want all kinds of amazing things in their life. They think about it. They might even write it down on paper. But then when it comes to execution, that's where most people fail. And then when we start to execute, then is, is we have to be really good about measuring along the way. You know, am I getting closer to or further away from what I really want? If I am, great, do more of it. If I'm not, then let's do less of that. And let's find those mentors or those role models or something that might have the answers and let's do that. But taking action is a big one, right? We, there's a lot of analysis paralysis out there, especially right now with COVID, a lot of people are afraid to make a mistake financially or whatever, you know, so sure. taking action, baby. Yeah, I love it. And then the other side of that, these self-imposed limits that we put on ourselves, what's one that you've seen that's the most prevalent that we need to remove right away? So it's lack of confidence. Right. I think that that's the biggest thing that we do is that we, we lack confidence. We place that limit upon ourselves that we're not good enough. I think we all have that, right. We're not in good enough to make that investment. We're not good enough to, to, to apply for that job that we know that we want because we don't feel that we have the experience or whatever. So it's just having the confidence to take action, following through, and then just surrounding yourself around some really good people, man. I remember, you know, for me, it's funny, right? Because there were positions that were opening up back in the day, right. When I first got started in this business, um, that I that I knew. I'm like, what the hell am I doing applying for this position? There's people that have you know 10 years more than I do and experience, got the degrees, got all this other stuff. And who am I? But I would do it anyway. And then I would go into those interviews and I would just, you know, it was a show. It was a Manny show. It was like a Vegas show. And people were paying that. to get in, right? <laughs> and then they had no, and then they had no no other alternative but to say, how can we not give this guy this opportunity? Yes. You know what I mean? So it's the confidence, man. I and sometimes that. things will work out and sometimes they won't, but as long as you have the confidence, you'll keep trying. I love that. Paul, Paul gave me a little bit of crap. One of the last uh, interviews I was part of, uh, I went in there saying, I am going to get this. I don't care. Like, I am going to crush this. And uh, go ahead. Re re review it, Paul. Stop, you always back. get that wrong. No, you didn't. You always get that wrong. I, I, I appreciate that, that attitude, that huspa. What you, what you were, what I was giving you crap about was like, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, I don't need a prep. I got this. I got this. <laughs> And I thought that cockiness was, hey, 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 you know, I know you got this, but, you know, it's okay to prep a little bit and, and be a little bit humble about it. That, that's what I was giving crap about. Not, all not all the my preparation was like Manny's. It was over the last years. I didn't need any, like, last minute prep. So that's what that prep was about, Paul. So, <laughs> but Manny, awesome. thank you so much for coming on the show, man. A lot of great insight it sounds like you're out there kicking ass, man. Um, I, I, I'd love to see what else you, you're out there doing. And I, I know that you brought a lot of value for our audience, man. So thank you so much for coming on the Action and Limits podcast. Love being here. Thank you for the invite. If there's anything else I can do to serve, just let me know. Wow. What a great guest Manny was.
is. What, what was your takeaways, Paul? Well, the first thing, the first thought that came into my head is the American dream. Hmm. He's living the American dream from rags to riches. And I got to tell you, Justin, when he was talking about the part about his, his father beating him and him standing up to his father and saying, you're the devil, I had to hold back tears. I was almost going to cry at that, at that powerful story. Uh, I, 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 I'm just blown away by Manny's story. What a, what a tremendous man. Yeah, it, it impressed me how he was able to, to come out of that. Because that's not something that a lot of people come out of, man. Like the, the stuff that he dealt with, for him to have the mindset that he has now, and, and yeah, he'll admit that he struggled through that, but being able he to- He never gave up. Yeah, and that persistence, that, mm-hmm. that grit, like you like to talk about, right? Like mm-hmm. it's like, like, you can't, that's not something you can learn. So that's, that's what's interesting. No excuses. He did not have any excuses. He no. never gave excuses, <laughs> man. And he had plenty of excuses to give, plenty of excuses to give. Mm-hmm. No, no, that was, it was such an amazing story. I am, I am so glad he came on. I, I, I can't speak highly enough about Manny and, and what he's accomplished. And I'm sure anyone that, that works with him or, or around him being exposed to that energy and his drive, it just lifts them up. Like I, I would, I would love to work with that dude. I, I, powerful guy doing a lot of great stuff. So wonderful show today, Paul, a w- really great guest. I'm glad that, that Manny came on the show and uh, shared his story with us and shared his, his undying drive to accomplish whatever, it, whatever he wants to. So so let's go ahead and wrap up the show with another segment of Ask Paul Anything. Uh, everyone out there, make sure to continue to send your questions into the show to get them featured on our segment and send them into actionsandlimits at gmail.com uh, to get them featured on the show. Paul, I pulled up one. Uh, it was an interesting question to me. This is from uh, Alex in Phoenix, Arizona. And he says, Paul, what two totally normal things become really weird if you do them back to back? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. What a unique question there. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, uh, pat your belly, pat your belly and your head at the same time uh, backwards. <laughs> I don't know. That could get weird. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure there's plenty of uh but i love that out of all the questions in the book we're going with that one okay <laughs> i thought it was very unique i, yes, I appreciate it it, the yeah. uniqueness of this question that came in yeah. so yeah uh, thank, thank you for the question yeah i i, <laughs> no, I, I i'm gonna chalk that up as a stump i think we can <laughs> yeah. on that one yeah. so thank you for sending your questions keep sending let me ask you questions. how would you answer that question you know, how would I answer that? You know, it, it, it'd be like, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, <laughs> without getting like really, I'm like, okay, if I was like two totally normal things if you did back to back, if I, uh, I don't know, if I made a sandwich and then went grocery shopping, I guess it'd be like, <laughs> that'd be weird, right? Like make dinner and then go to the grocery store. It's a little weird. <laughs> you're like you don't like my answer oh. <laughs> great show paul what an amazing guest we had um i can't wait to check out more of his content and hear about what what manny's got going on so uh amazing show today paul for justin atherton this is paul fortune we'll see you next week all right see you next monday Thank you for listening to the show. Don't miss an episode. Click and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on your favorite podcast platform and find us on Instagram and Facebook under Actions and Limits to stay updated on all our upcoming content. Continue to email the show at actionsandlimits at gmail.com for our segment Ask Paul Anything. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.